Hello and thanks for coming to my talk. My name is Amir Goharshadi. Today I'm going to talk to you about polynomial invariant generation. This is a joint work with Krishnandu Chatterjee, Hong Fei Fu, and Ehsan Goharshadi. So let's start with the very basics. What is an invariant? As I'm sure you all know, an invariant is basically an assertion at some point of the program that holds whenever a valid run of the program reaches that point. In other words, an invariant is an over-approximation of the set of reachable states of a program. And with this definition, we would consider post conditions to be a special case of invariant. So when we talk about invariant generation, we usually focus on inductive invariance. And what we mean by inductive invariance is the type of invariant that can be proven using induction. So here's a formal definition. Let's see be a set of program locations that is visited by every execution cycle of the program. So in other words, C is a cut set. We basically assign some assertion AL to every location L in C. And then these assertions form an inductive invariant if they satisfy the following two conditions. The first condition is called initiation and it's very similar to the base case in induction. Basically what it says is that when we visit one of the locations in C for the first time, the, the assertion at that location should hold. So the invariant should hold. And then we have consecution which says that if I start from one of these locations and do a simple execution pass and reach another location, if initially the, the invariant used to hold, then now the invariant should hold again. And it's obvious that an inductive invariant is an invariant, and the main method for showing that some assertion at some point of a program is an invariant is to actually find an inductive invariant that strengthens that assertion. Because invariant generation is so classical and important, you can imagine that many people have worked on it over the years, and there are many different approaches to invariant generation, each with their own weaknesses and strengths. But in this work, we are going to focus on polynomial invariant generation. And what I mean by polynomial invariant generation is that we consider imperative programs with polynomial guards, so polynomial branching, polynomial guards for the while loops, and also polynomial assignments. And what we look into is to try to generate invariants that are conjunctions of polynomial inequalities. And the important point here is that uh, we are generating polynomial inequalities and not equalities. M many previous works focused on equalities. This work is about inequalities. And when it comes to this problem, uh, the previous approaches for generating these kind of invariants lack like at least one of these three criteria. So they are either not automated for example, they need some extra input from the user while we are looking for some sort of push button approach. Or they lack completeness. They can generate some invariant, but they can't give any guarantee of completeness. Or they're not applicable. Now let me walk you through the choice that we had previously. So if you choose to have automation and completeness, there is an approach due to Kapoor, which was published in 2004, that generates polynomial invariants using quantifier elimination. And the problem with this is exactly that. It, it uses quantifier elimination. And quantifier elimination is very time consuming. It takes doubly exponential time. It's not even applicable to programs with 10 lines of code. Another choice that we have is to sacrifice completeness in order to gain in applicability and speed. And there are many approaches that do this. One of my favorite ones is from Popple 2018. It's called Nonlinear Reasoning for Invariant Synthesis. And the thing about these approaches is that they're really scalable. They can handle real world programs. But on the other hand, the problem is that they can't really provide any guarantee of completeness. Finally, we can give up on automation and just use an interactive theorem prover that uses input, extra input from the user in order to find the proof that some assertion is an invariant. So the question is, why can't we have all of these criteria? Why can't we have applicability, automation, and completeness guarantees? And the answer is actually we can. And I'm going to show you a very simple way of generating invariants that provides all three guarantees. Let me illustrate our approach using a very simple example. Consider this program with some precondition that is given at the beginning of the program, and let's say that we want to generate invariants for uh, the parts of the program that are shown here inside the then block, inside the else block, and also we want to generate a post condition. And let's say that we have a template for our invariant and post condition. So basically what I want to do is that I have this unknown coefficients, c1 to c8, and I want to find real values for these unknown coefficients so that overall they become uh, an inductive invariant. 
Let's start by just writing down the conditions of initiation and consecution as in the definition of inductive invariance. So in this program, let's say that in some path of the program, I enter the then branch. What happens then? Basically, what I know is that the precondition used to hold, and then because I've entered the then branch, this means that the if condition holds. And from this, I have to make sure that th these two conditions together entail the invariant inside the then branch. Similarly, if the if condition does not hold, I am going to enter the else branch, and then I have to satisfy the invariant at the else branch. So let's see what other transitions we have. We have a transition from inside the then branch to the end of the program. So at the beginning of this transition, the invariant holds. And then what we do is that we change the value of x. We do this assignment x equal to y. And then afterwards, we have to make sure that the post condition holds. One thing that I have to mention about my notation is that I have two different types of variables here. There are program variables such as x and y. And then there are uh, these coefficient variables, the CIs. And what I want to do is that I want to synthesize values for the CIs such that these conditions hold for all possible values of X and Y. So I use the color red to show which variables I am trying to solve for. Now, if you look at our conditions here, they have a very nice form. They, are, they all say that if some polynomials are non-negative, then we want some other polynomial to also be non-negative. Basically, the non-negativity of polynomials on the left-hand side should entail non-negativity of the one on the right-hand side. Now, okay, so the first two conditions are actually very easy to solve. We can basically uh, take our polynomials from the left-hand side and just copy them in the right-hand side. And it's also easy to see that this is sound. Of course, it's sound. We can basically take any non-negative multiple of a polynomial on the left-hand side and use it for the right-hand side. But what happens with the third and fourth uh, condition are a bit more tricky. So we can't do this here anymore because if you look at it, the left-hand side is a quadratic polynomial, but the right-hand side is a linear polynomial. So how can we solve this? And the idea here is actually quite simple. The idea is what happens if we use non-negative polynomials instead of non-negative real numbers? So for example, we know that any polynomial that is a square or a sum of squares is always non-negative. So without loss of generality, we can add the non-negativity of a square polynomial to the left-hand side. And this is what I've done here exactly. And if you see, I'm introducing two new variables here. I'm introducing a and b, and these are also unknown variables. And these new coefficients are going to give me more leeway in solving my system. So now I have two non-negative polynomials on the left-hand side, and I want to deduce the one on the right. Well, one way of doing this is if I can just write the polynomial on the right as a combination of the ones in the left. And in this combination, I can use real numbers as the coefficients, or I can use sum of square polynomials as the coefficients, because I know that sum of square polynomials are always non-negative. But let's say that I use a simple coefficient like d here, which is a non-negative real number. So now I want to solve this equality. Now, this equality is actually a polynomial equality over our program variable y, and it should hold for all values of y. So what this tells me is that this equality holds if and only if all the corresponding coefficients on the left-hand side and the right-hand side are equal. So I can basically say that the coefficient of y squared on the left-hand side is 0. On the right-hand side, it's a squared minus d. So I should have 0 equals a squared minus d. I can write the same kind of equation for the coefficient of y and also for the constant factor. And now notice that what I got out of this is a series of uh, quadratic equations. But these are quadratic, quadratic equations over my coefficient variables. The program variables are no longer here. And now I can just pass this to a quadratic solver and get one solution. For example, I get this solution here. Basically, what I did here was that I showed that the linear polynomial 10 minus y is a combination of the quadratic polynomial 100 minus y squared and some square polynomial which is guaranteed to be non-negative. And this ends my solution. We now have the inductive invariant that we were looking for. We just take the values that we synthesized as the solution of our quadratic program and 
just plug them back into our template and here is a complete solution. Now our general approach is basically what you saw in that example, except that we want to automate everything and make sure that the user doesn't have to give us too much input. All we want the user to give us is the degree of the polynomials. So here's an outline of our approach. We start with generating a template and this is because we don't want to ask the user to give us the template. And what we do here is that we generate the most general possible template. We basically uh, generate a template that consists of all the possible terms. For example, if I'm looking for quadratic invariance over two program variables x and y, this is the type of template that I generate. And of course, if I have more than one inequality, if I want to have more than one inequality at every location of the program, I can generate several of these at every location. The second step is to compute the conditions that need to be satisfied by these uh, polynomial inequalities in order to make sure that we have an inductive invariant. So these are the inductivity conditions, what we call initiation and consecution. And we compute all of these conditions for all the transitions of the program. Now to solve these kind of conditions, what we do is again similar to that example. We try to write the polynomial on the right-hand side. We try to write G as a combination of the polynomials on the left-hand side, basically the GIs. But in this combination, the coefficients are not just non-negative reals. They are actually non-negative polynomials. They are sum of square polynomials. So I can write G in this form, in the form uh, of H0 plus sum of HIGI. And basically the idea is that HIs are some polynomials. And I don't know the polynomials HI either. So as in the example, I'm going to just create a template for the HIs and also have unknown coefficients in this template. So I'm calling it, for example, A0 to A5 here. Now, equality one is actually, again, an equality between polynomials over program variables. So I can just equate the corresponding coefficients on the two sides of equality one. And this gives me quadratic equations over my unknown variables over the C variables and the A variables, and it makes sure that none of the program variables appear anymore. Finally, note that I cannot give arbitrary values to my A variables, for example, to A0 to A5 here, because I also have to ensure that each HI is a sum of squares polynomial. So I have to add some extra conditions to my quadratic system that ensures that every HI is sum of squares. And I'm not going to go into the details of that. Please read our paper about this. It's a very standard step and we can actually do this. So finally, we have a quadratic system and we know that every solution of this quadratic system, when we, put, when we take the values of the solution and plug them back into the template, gives us an inductive invariant. So the only thing that we have to do is that we have to solve the resulting quadratic system. And for this, we just use off-the-shelf uh, quadratic optimizers, QP solvers, and give it to them to solve it. So this is basically our algorithm, and now let's talk about soundness, completeness, and complexity of the algorithm. Well, first of all, soundness is trivial, because what we're doing is that we are writing each polynomial G as a combination of sum of squares and the polynomials GI, and of course, if every GI is non-negative, and we know that every HI is sum of squares and therefore non-negative, so G is also going to be non-negative. So soundness is very easy. Now let's go over to completeness. Our completeness is actually proven using a very well-known theorem in real algebraic geometry, which is called Putinar's positive Stellenzatz. And what Putinar's positive Stellenzatz does is that it characterizes positive polynomials over compact semi-algebraic sets. What do I mean by that? I mean that under some side conditions, for example, under this compactness condition here, if some polynomial G is positive whenever some other polynomials GI are non-negative, then this theorem says that G can certainly be written in this form. So basically G can, can always be written in the form of our algorithm, basically a combination of the GIs and sum of square polynomials HIs. And this is great because it gives us a very nice completeness results for generating polynomial inductive invariants. But Putinor's positive Schellenzatz comes with its own side conditions and these translate to side conditions in our completeness result. So the most important one of these side conditions is the compactness. And in terms of programs, this translates to uh, having bounds on the values of the program variables. Another side condition here is that this theorem actually only characterizes uh, polynomials that are strictly positive. So our completeness also only holds for strongly positive 
uh, inequalities in our inductive invariants. Please see our paper for more details and the proof of this theorem. So let's talk a little bit about complexity and applicability. We can analyze the complexity of the approach based on uh, several different parameters, but let's just fix the length of the invariant at every point, and let's also fix the degree of the polynomials in our algorithm, because we, we don't want uh, invariants of arbitrary degree, we want invariants of a fixed degree, of course. If we do this, and then we want to analyze the runtime of the algorithm based on the size of the program, then it's a polynomial time reduction from invariant generation to quadratic programming. Here are our experimental results over a bunch of benchmarks that we took from the literature. So what we did here was that we ran our algorithm as well as several previous sound but incomplete approaches, and also the only previous approach that provided a completeness guarantee. And what you can see right away is that uh, if you look at the very rightmost column, the complete approach always times out. It's not applicable to any of the benchmarks. It's not even applicable to small benchmarks. Some of these benchmarks had less than 10 lines of code. So the completeness there comes at a very hefty price. On the other hand, if you look at the approaches that are sound but not complete, you see that they are super fast most of the time but they can't really find all the invariants. So there are many cases where an inductive invariant exists, a polynomial inductive invariant exists, but these approaches fail to synthesize it or are not applicable, or in some cases they actually time out. In contrast, if you look at our approach, you see that it works on all of these benchmarks here. Its runtime is not as good as the incomplete approaches, but the good thing is that now we have completeness guarantee and we have it at a much lower price. So in summary, we provided a new algorithm for polynomial invariant generation that provides automation, completeness, and applicability. Finally, it is noteworthy that we can extend our approach to recursive programs. Please see the paper for all the proofs and the extension to the recursive case. Thank you so much for coming to my talk, and I'm looking forward to answering any questions.